I'm Kelly Rogers, Associate Editor for DevX, and I'm joined here today by Manuel Hurwitz, who is the Director of Pro Programs Division for International Planned Parenthood Federation, and by Sarah Shaw, who is the Head of Advocacy for Marie Stopes International, and we're super happy to have you here today, particularly considering the news um, out today, the new report that shows just how far the global gag rule is reaching. And as we know, it's already had dramatic implications for programming and obviously obviously for the women on the ground who that programming is meant to support. Um, and so I'm really glad to have your, your take here today um, on hopefully the systems and the policies and the structures that we need to put in place in order to ensure safe abortion. Um, and so following on that, the new report, um, Manuel, that was, that was out today, that looks at four different countries and just the scope of the global gag rule and the effect that it's had on programming. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what that looks like for, for your programs on the ground. So thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, Kelly. Um, yes, so um, the global gag rule has had some uh, significant implication for, uh, for our programs uh, at IPPF. Uh, and uh, the first implication um, is of course, quite direct and quite measurable is around the number of projects that uh, have been uh, affected and that uh, had to, to close down. So, uh, for instance, we've had a, a total of about um, 49 projects in 31 countries that have been affected. Uh, and to give a, a little example of what that means, uh, we've had, for instance, in Zambia, um, two programs specifically working on HIV that have had to uh, uh, to a close, as well as in Ethiopia, 10 clinics working specifically with uh, sex workers and providing an extended and integrated package of, uh, of sexual reproductive health services that have also been affected and have to scale down their, their operation, as well as 15 youth clinics. And that is also uh, uh, without counting the uh, significant reduction in commodities that have also been uh, affecting the, uh, the operations in Ethiopia but also in other countries. Um, and it's not just in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that we've seen the impact. Um, if uh, closer to this region in, in Latin America, and uh, for instance, uh, what we've seen is that um, our uh, region there, in covering Latin America and the Caribbean, has experienced a loss of about $4.5 million. Uh, and that's really severely affected uh, their, their programs. And their programs, uh, we are not just talking about abortion program, we're yeah. talking about a program on the prevention of Zika, we're talking about HIV programs, we're talking about gender-based violence programs, and uh, they, of course, programs that both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, Latin America and in South Asia, which is the third region affected by the global gag rule uh, in, in IPPF, where um, people who have been affected were people uh, in the most vulnerable regions, in countries, uh, people who are young, poor, living in rural areas, uh, and uh, migrant populations as well. So um, that's just to give a little extent yeah. of, of, the, um, of the implication of, of the global gag route in measurable terms. Absolutely. That's the direct impact. There is a lot to s as well of the indirect impact yeah. of the global gag rule. Um, the, uh, the, what we refer to as the chilling effect, uh, that is the fact, and let's just remember what gag stands for. It stands for silence. And what the global gag rule has done is it's really trying and attempting to silence civil society organization, to silence communities, to silence women, uh, and really that what we do need to really make sure that we continue um, um, pushing against and make sure that the voices of the civil societies, the voice of the women, the voice yeah. of the communities are not gagged. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really, that's one of the indirect impact is that that's chilling effect that is preventing organization to want to join on the work of what they consider to be uh, possibly directly or indirectly uh, linked to uh, abortion, Absolutely. but that's affecting sexual reproductive health and general health care. Yeah, I was just, I was just having that conversation um, today with someone else actually and 
that was her biggest concern was this chilling effect. And Sarah, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about um, Manuel brought up Zika, about HIV, about the far reaching implications of this beyond abortion. Yeah. Uh, well, for my Stokes International, because we are, our focus is access to safe abortion, uh, post abortion care, and family planning. We've, for us, it's really the loss of the family planning funds that has right. affected us. Um, I mean, it, it was 17% of our operating budget in um, 2017. And the impact of that has been um, 1.4 million women and girls will lose access to our services by 2020. And we estimate that that's going to contribute to an additional 1.8 million unintended pregnancies, 600,000 unsafe abortions, and um, 4,500 avoidable maternal deaths. Um, and even, I'm just sitting here kind of wondering, what, what about the morale of your staff? Like, how, how does this affect actual, you know, operations on, on the ground? Does, does that, does it impact sort of, um, you know, really, really deep um, kind of implications for people's, you know, mental health yeah. who are working on these issues, for example? I think that's an excellent question because we often do not really recognize or uh, talk about what the impact is on people on the ground. Yeah. Providers who are doing already yeah. work that in very difficult circumstances and very sensitively, as uh, Sarah says, uh, are providing uh, services uh, like abortion, safe abortion care, like providing contraceptive and also working with very vulnerable um, uh, populations. And uh, yes, when you do have to close clinics, then uh, unfortunately that also means uh, a loss of, of uh, of job and and uh, and uh, it is extremely important to to recognize that. At the same time, I think we are very privileged. Uh, I think both in both our organization to be working with very very resilient and strong uh, staff who are extremely committed. And I think that and this is one maybe of the of turning ahead a little bit the the conversation around the global gag rule is that it has also generated a huge mobilization. Uh, and that huge mobilization mm. is true uh, among the providers, among the staff who really are more than ever determined to provide the services uh, to, to women who need them, but also uh, in generating and building a movement of uh, like-minded organization who really want to do what is right. And, uh, and we see that in a lot of those regions and those countries where in actual terms, where we are a small community-based organization working in um, the Eastern Congo, um, the global gag rule might affect you, but at the same time, in terms of funding and opportunities, but it also uh, has created opportunities to be joining in a network of like-minded organization. And then, thanks to the mobilization of other donors, yeah. an opportunity to then make sure that services continue to some extent. We won't cover the full extent of what we've lost potentially because, of course, USAID is a big donor uh, in family planning and reproductive health. But at the same time, I think it's been extremely rewarding to see the uh, um, other organization and other donors coming forward and wanting to make sure that some of that gap is, is filled. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I wonder... Just considering the new ICRW report that came out that's looking at, you know, what's next, are, are there, and, and the, the sort of regulations and guidelines aren't that clear um, in terms of, of the people that I've spoken with. Um, so we're really not sure, it feels like, what, what happens after this, especially with the expanded global gag rule. Are there thoughts of how that could, could also impact your work? I mean, from our perspective, the expanded global gag rule. We, when it came out in March, we looked across our projects, and we've got we've got four projects that are potentially at risk. Um, a couple of them are coming towards the end, and so we're hoping that, you know, maybe by the time the guidance comes out, the right. the project will be ended. Um, the the real impact that we're seeing is uh, because you know the size of these projects compared to the hit that we've already taken is quite small. I mean, obviously any hit is a is a huge hit because it's taking away and diverting attention from the services that that need to be delivered. But um, you know, it's it's not so big compared to 2017. But is what we are 
concerned about really is like Manuel was saying the chilling effect it's really going to affect our partnerships on the ground yeah um, future partnerships and also it's essentially censoring other donors it, th this expansion is essentially saying to other sovereign nations who they can and can't work with and that's the part that's that's, yeah. that's the pit that's really frightening and really unknown because we don't know where that's going to take us yeah I mean, are, are there ideas or are, are, don are you seeing donors speak up already um, sort of saying, well, we don't want our funds affected by, um, by these gui the guidance issued by the U.S. government or, or is there sort of silence while this well, is Well, the creation out? of the movement of She mm. Decides of has course, been yeah. a, a clear sign of many donors that they were not ready right. to be uh, dictated uh, mm. by, uh, by the U.S. government on to what they could fund and, and mm. they really also, uh, it was also a, a, a clear sign that they understood the importance of um, abortion as an essential health care uh, uh, service and the impact that uh, depriving uh, women of access to uh, uh, safe abortion, what would that create in terms of increased unintended pregnancies and increased unsafe abortion? And they just wanted to make sure that services would continue as much as possible. So I think that reaction has happened and yeah. it's, been, it's been very mm. positive. I think the extended uh, global gag rule has really created a feeling of uncertainty. Uh, and that's I think is something we've really been uh, we've had to really uh, um, work again around, um, particularly a feeling of uncertainty of what could you fund or not fund, who could you work with or not yeah. work with in particular is a really big issue. So uh, a lot of time had to be said or clarifying so that there is a, not a risk of over-interpretation. Mm -hmm. And that is the chilling effect, is this risk of over-interpretation, this, this uh, feeling that let's not just go there because it's too That's complicated. Yeah. We just don't know yeah. what that may be. Um, and I think we really need to make sure that's not the case. Mm. And there are also efforts, um, aside from she, she Decides, to sort of counteract this. And one example, I think, was this morning, the launch of, I believe it's, it's Safe Access, this online platform mm. um, to try and get the tools and the education needed about safe abortion out to a wider audience and those on the ground who need it. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and what your thoughts are on that. And also, I mean, what else... Uh, you know, stepping aside from the global gag rule, what else do you want to see happen um, in terms of policies or structures that would that would help safe abortion moving into the future? Okay. I mean, the, the Safe Access Project is a that's a really exciting move to really the, the abortion community over the years. We've generated a huge amount of knowledge and technical expertise, but because abortion is such a stigmatized issue, we've not always been so great about getting it out there and communicating it. And I, this is a great opportunity to really showcase all the expertise and knowledge that we've built up and also ensure that it's getting into the hands of the providers and the activists that need this information. And by, by putting it out there, by being proud of what we, we've done, this will hopefully contribute to the destigmatization. I mean, one of the, the big challenges of the global gag is it's already a the abortion is already a stigmatized issue. No one wants to talk about it. And we're right. self-stigmatizing by not talking about it and not owning our, our achievements. Yeah. So this is a really great opportunity to get it out there, help normalize and give those on the ground that are delivering the services, doing the advocacy, give them the tools that they need so they can start owning this in their own context and their own health systems. And it sounded like a really collaborative yeah. effort as yeah. well. Yes, so and again, a, great yeah. a yeah. sign a sign of the times that really we uh, all want the same thing, yeah. and we also realize that together we can amplify our voice yeah. and be much stronger. Yeah. And I think really what Safe Access uh, does, and, and we're very proud to be associated mm. with that initiative uh, as well, is that um, it does. Um, allow information and evidence because I think there has been so much attack on evidence. We are now in a, in a, in a world, in a, uh, particularly we've seen that in the US again, where scientific information is often denigrated. And we need to make sure that through tools like Safe Access, we put back evidence there and evidence that is generated through implementation of programs, mm -hmm. uh, through implementing research, um, and that we can 
can make available to everyone who really needs to have that information. Yeah. Uh, and so a tool like that, but there are other tools out there that really are going to be very valuable. IPPF has uh, launched a um, medical abortion commodities database uh, in September last year. And uh, the, uh, the objective of that database is really to put information on product that are quality assured uh, uh, and a searchable, open, public database where you can see what uh, medical abortion commodities are available where. Um, again, it is about evidence. It is about giving information so that managers, procurers, manufacturers, communities, people, donors, uh, journalists can find the information they need. Uh, and therefore, uh, we are, as Sarah said very well, destigmatizing and normalizing the conversation on abortion. Yeah. Are there other efforts that stand out to you on the ground um, that kind of play into that destigmatization? Because I think that's such an important mm. piece of this that keeps coming out as part of the global gag rule, but also just writ large um, around abortion. Are, are you seeing efforts there, change there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, def I think from the advocacy perspective, we're seeing the growth of um, national advocacy networks who are really, civil society are convening to really defend a woman's right to choose and the to react against the opposition. You know, we, we saw recently in Nigeria, there was some opposition activity and the NGOs just coordinated and organized and they reclaimed the narrative and, and they told their own story. They shaped it um, in respect of women, uh, women's rights. Um, we're, we're seeing positive changes in some countries in the um, uh, policy conversations. You know, we're seeing really healthy um, conversations around the impact of unsafe abortion and um, the, the legal frameworks in countries where previously abortion was hugely stigmatized. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for example, uh, Zimbabwe, there's a really healthy dialogue around, you know, the, the, the terrible toll of unsafe abortion in the country. Um, and then I, th I think from the provider's perspective, I mean, we've had, we've had great experience with a methodology called Provider Share um, Workshop. Being an abortion provider in a restrictive setting is a long and lonely road. A lot of our providers, often their families don't know what they do, really. People in their uh -huh. church won't know what they do. So they're carrying around a huge burden of, of not having anywhere to, anybody to talk to or confined in. And Provider Share Workshop is a methodology whereby we provide a safe space for providers to come and talk about their hopes and fears around what they're doing, um, share their experiences. And, you know, we've found that that's had a really positive impact in terms of um, staff retention. It's helped us keep staff. It's reduced burnout. It's, um, you know, made them feel more positive about what they do, made them feel like they can be um, uh, very visible activists um, for the issue. So the, there, are, there are good things happening and it's, it's what we're seeing in civil society and women reclaiming this agenda, and reclaiming their bodies. That's great to hear. Yeah. And I would answer your question in a, in a pro, a pro, from a pro, programmatic perspective. Okay. Um, I think that uh, what the global gag rule is really uh, uh, doing, and it is a concerted um, attack on, on women, and it is a concerted attack on, on women's uh, control over their own body. And what's really happening in reality is that women have taken control. Um, there is an increase in self-management of, uh, of abortion. Um, we've had a lot of sessions during this conference yeah. on self-care. WHO is about to uh, launch and release uh, the guidelines on self-care in July. And what is happening is that the technology that is medical abortion is being, uh, has allowed women to really take control and use that technology in order to uh, to control their reproductive lives. And that's something, that's a progress that we will not stop. Yeah. Um, whatever policies, whatever laws, um, we will not stop. Of course, there needs to be organizations like Mary Stopes International, like IPPF, that, still, that are 
that still need to make sure that there is a supportive environment mm -hmm. uh, so that women are not criminalized uh, for doing something that is their right. Um, and there still is a need to make sure that the, the method, the technology is safe and accessible yeah. and affordable. But at the same time, we will not stop that movement. And um, that is really the best way of, of normalizing abortion. Uh, and it needs to be accompanied by efforts in order to really open the discussion and make sure that um, there is a, a, um, a recognition of abortion as an essential health care so that again we normalize abortion and that again it is no longer something that needs to be pushed under the, yeah. under the, the carpet. Absolutely. Are there other gaps on your mind right now or, or sort of in your imagination if you could fix something right now or invent something um, to kind of to, to further safe abortion care or to make, you know, providing it better for, you know, the, those that, that work for your organizations on the ground, what would, what would that be, do you think? Or it could be a policy? <laughs> I think that talking again about technology, yeah. um, research is... I think undergoing uh, is still undertaken uh, to uh, improve the technology we currently have. I think a few years ago, no one would ever expect that we would have um, um, a, um, um, a combi pack, or i.e. A, um, a combination of mifepristone and misoprostol that women could do and self-induce uh, an abortion absolutely safely. Um, nobody would anticipate that this would also be recognized as a safe method and that uh, WHO would be now recognizing self-care yeah. as an important mechanism of, of, of uh, accessing health care. So I think technology can always be improved. Mm. We can make it... Uh, we can make misoprostol uh, more stable, less sensitive to heat and humidity, which means that it's going to be uh, more available in the countries where uh, there are issues around heat and humidity and where often uh, we don't have access to fridge or uh, where the commodity cannot be kept in the best conditions. Yeah. Um, I think that there is uh, the potential also of looking at a, a, a product, uh, a commodity or, or a pill that could combine both the, um, the uh, effect of uh, misoprostol or mifepristone. We can dream of an extended there, you're emergency <laughs> contraception. You've talked about this yeah. before. Uh, yeah. it, 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 the technology still yeah. can evolve. Yeah. yeah. So I think I've got I think I've got three things. I mean I think definitely the 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 one dose medical abortion um, because it's the the current combi pack, you know it's it's complicated and 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 you know in a you may be in a stressed out situation. Yeah. The last thing you need is, is complicated it guidelines. In the absence of a one-dose MA, I would like to see uh, mifepristone registration worldwide and on all essential drug lists. So it's prioritised for procurement, which means it is available in the public sector and yeah. it's in the system. I'd like to see um, values clarification and legal literacy around um, abortion law and regulation being an absolutely mandatory part of pre-service training for all cadres of health providers and lawmakers and law enforcers. Too often we're having to do that as an additional add-on hmm. after the event and it's the NGOs that are having to do it and the amount that we can reach, I mean it's, it's a drop in the ocean compared to all the providers out there and by getting the next generations coming through the system it will be normalised and, and acceptable. And then I think the third thing I would like to see is um, consistent investment in a strong civil society for the advocacy and accountability yeah. piece yeah. because you know we've seen in the in the US even when the law is there do not comp get complacent your work is not done you're constantly having to hold the duty bearers feet to the fire and that's why a really strong civil society and investment in advocacy is absolutely critical yeah. to the sustainability and on the advocacy side I would like to really emphasize the importance of not sidelining abortion when we are talking about 
about reproductive health. Yeah. Um, and that's so easy to do. And uh, many organizations and many donors agencies are guilty of doing so. They are claiming the space as large sex reproductive health organization, mm. yeah. a sex reproductive health donor. But the reality is that they are not willing to talk about abortion. They are even less willing to fund abortion services. And until this is going to happen, we cannot really uh, truly believe in secondative health and rights. Mm, yeah, I think that's a really good point, Manuel. I think, uh, you know, when, it could, when we, a, a lot of space is being claimed for family planning and actually we need, we need to look at that differently and actually think about, actually, this is not about family planning or about abortion. This is about preventing unintended pregnancies and accepting that sometimes women don't want to be pregnant and that means maybe they need contraception or maybe they need an abortion but it's part of the same package. Yeah. And I'm really hoping that the forthcoming ICPD at 25 meetings in Nairobi is an opportunity for us to take what was in Cairo, which was groundbreaking at the time and has got us this far, but to say, actually, we're living in a different world now. We need to reinvent that frame and really talk about unintended pregnancies and women's right to have or, have, or to be Absolutely. or not be pregnant. And popular movement can make that happen. Yeah. And they might actually make that happen quicker than us as organization mm -hmm. can do. We see what happened in uh, Ireland. Uh, we nearly did it in Argentina. And I think we can definitely do it again. And there is that energy and there is that movement. Mm -hmm. What's happening now in the US might create this again yeah. there. Uh, we can see it happening really right now. Uh, the young generation is mobilizing. Uh, and uh, I think that as they are mobilizing for climate change, they will be mobilizing too, mm -hmm. if rights that they actually have taken for granted, having been born in a, in a, in a world where they thought these rights were, 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 uh, were, were already assured, they will go back in the street and claim those back. So uh, I am optimistic about that. But the other thing I also want to add, and that's right. really important, is that if you're looking at um, the global gag rule and what's happening, you do see a pushback in general uh, because the global gag rule is a result of a pushback from populist government, nationalist government, uh, the macro politics, which our director general was talking earlier yeah. uh, during his plenary session. Um, and we see that in the US and we see that in other countries of, of, of the West as well. But in reality, when you look at countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, the revolution is happening. Mm. Uh, services are becoming increasingly available without necessarily always uh, as a result of a change of, of, of legislation. We need to continue to push for law reform. This is what both organizations are doing. But the reality is that already as it's happening, guidelines are being produced for the provision of services. And uh, we are seeing in some pocket of Africa, and I'm thinking particularly in Francophone Africa, for instance, yeah. we are seeing significant advances uh, that are maybe not sometimes enough spoken about. Absolutely. And, and going back to the numbers that you both provided at the start of our conversation, um, you know, which are astonishing, really, the, the amount of your programming that's, that's being affected by the global gag rule. What will you take back to your organizations from, from these meetings? Are you expecting um, perhaps a new partnership, a new agreement, um, at least a, a conversation moved forward? Um, yeah, what, what would you like to, to bring back? What I think we will bring back is the uh, importance of reaching to actors that we haven't reached uh, to before. Right. I think we do need to extend the conversation with organizations working on disability, with organizations that are feminist organizations but may not have seen our organization as natural partners in the past. We do need to also be uh, looking at organizations that work on reproductive health uh, uh, but um, and are interested and committed to the issue on ab of abortion, but not necessarily do not know how to do it. Um, I am also on the uh, uh, on the board of the Safe Abortion Action Fund, mm. and uh, the fund works with lo small local organization. Uh, and um, just to give you an example, in a recent round, we had 400 applications, and a lot of those applications were from organization whose primary mission was HIV, right. was uh, gender, 
was um, um, disability. And so uh, those countries, uh, those uh, organizations, because of the work they were doing and the communities and the people they were serving, really recognized the importance of uh, adding abortion as part of their of their services and we need to have more dialogue with them and it was great to see them already yeah. a lot more present at this conference than they were in the previous conferences great yeah. well thank you i don't know if you have something to add there um, quickly before we well, wrap just quickly i think i think for us the, the the main lesson is diversification beyond the health agenda okay um so making the links with movements like climate change education and it's really only when sexual and reproductive health and rights are embedded and mainstream throughout those movements that it will, will be fully protected and accepted. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much, thank Manuel and Sarah, for being thank here, you. for your insights on, on the Global Gag Rule. And, and that is it for us for now from Women Deliver. <laughs>